Hello, and welcome to Education for the 21st Century. We're a monthly podcast brought to you by the College of Education here at Lehigh University. We focus on challenging issues in the U.S. educational system and in society today. We bring attention concerns such as educational leadership, school and community, innovation in education, research to practice, social and cultural dynamics in schools, and most of all, we bring excellent guests. <laughs> <laughs> to our show to discuss such issues. Today we have Dr. George DuPaul, and I would also like to uh, introduce, I'm, by the way, I'm Floyd Peacham <laughs> from the Educational Leadership Department here, uh, program here at uh, Lehigh University. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce uh, Tashina. Hi there, I'm Tashina. I'm a doctoral student at Lehigh University, and I'd like to introduce Dr. DuPaul. Dr. George DuPaul is a professor of school psychology and associate dean for research in the College of Education at Lehigh University. He has been an author or co-author on over 230 journal articles and book chapters, as well as nine books and two videos related to ADHD and pediatric school psychology. Dr. DuPaul was School Psychologist of the Year in Pennsylvania in 1999 and was the recipient of the 2008 Senior Scientist Award from Division 16 School Psychology for the American Psychological Association and was named to the Chad of Hall of Fame in 2008. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. So before we begin, could you elaborate um, a bit more on what CHAD Hall of Fame is? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, CHAD is an advocacy organization uh, that uh, stands for Children and Adults with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And it's an organization that's been around since the late 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, international organization that's focused on advocacy for educational and mental health support for individuals with ADHD. What an honor. <laughs> yeah, very honored to, to be a part of their Hall of Fame. Thank you. Yes, Dr. DePaul is um, probably one of the, I, I consider him what, easily one of the nation's leaders in the area of uh, uh, ADHD. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty, it was pretty evident. Um, I think the clear a clear moment for me was I think we got quoted in was it Newsweek? <laughs> yeah, per, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if you want to speak to that that uh, that incident, but um, you corrected the record on a national scale um, in relationship to a pretty big event. If you want to maybe speak to yeah, that. Yeah, I think for, you're, for you're talking years. about the school shooting. Yeah. 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 There was a school. Well, it was the shooting in Parkland, yeah. Florida. Uh, that occurred, I guess, almost two years ago now. Mm. Hard to believe that it's been that long. But the uh, perpetrator of that shooting had been treated with, or was being treated with Ritalin, which is a central nervous system stimulant that's sometimes used for treating ADHD. And um, so some of the uh, gun rights, uh, in reaction to the gun calls for gun control, some of the gun rights groups, um, including Ollie North, who at the time was the um, CEO or president, I guess, of, NRA, mm -hmm. of the NRA, uh, basically tried to shift the blame from guns to um, to the fact that Ritalin uh, could, his assertion was that Ritalin could cause aggression uh, in, or perhaps even, you know, to lead somebody to do what the perpetrator of that crime did. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was uh, asked to comment on that um, and, and point out that there is absolutely no research to support the idea that uh, a stimulant medication like Ritalin would cause somebody to engage in this level of violence. If anything, Ritalin helps uh, individuals mm -hmm. with ADHD to be less aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. I think that was a, is a great example of how, you know, just really sort of going to the research um, to one, correct the record, but to provide clarity when sort of political agendas and mm. these kinds of things confuse and obfuscate the issue. Um, part of our job as scholars and researchers is to sort of stick to the research and, you know, speak to the evidence. And I thought this was just a great example of, you know, this is the value of research to society in general. Great. Thank, yeah, thank you for that. I actually probably relates to something we're going to discuss later on, but one of the things that I'm trying to uh, help our uh, colleagues in, in our college and as well as our colleagues in other universities who engage in educational research to do is make clearer connections between their data and uh, potential policy implications. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we often talk about research to practice and promoting the connection between research to practice, which of course is extremely important. But I think it's also important for us to think about the impact that our research has for uh, policy related to education. Yes. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And with that, now for the for the more formalized part, <laughs> now we're going to toss in some of this informal stuff if, if you don't mind. But sure, we'll, we'll try to stick to the script as much as possible. <laughs> so, what got what initially got you interested in um, school based academic and behavioral interventions for youth in K twelve settings? Yeah, I mean, there's not one seminal event, but it, I, I think that where I started on this course was when I was an undergraduate uh, student at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Um, I, as I was a psychology major and, and also uh, had a minor in education, and I wasn't sure what path I was going to take in, in terms of you know being a psychologist or or a teacher, and I worked for two summers uh, in their Upward Bound program, mm -hmm. which w helped um, economically disadvantaged students in the in that area of Connecticut mm -hmm. during the summer, and I taught in that program, taught Earth Science in that program, and uh, there were two. Um, uh, school psychologists who were uh, part of the Upward Bound mm -hmm. team and I got to know them uh, a little bit and, and got to learn about the profession of school psychology and uh, it intrigued me that you know I could I could uh, be in a profession where I'd be working you know hand in hand with educators but uh, more of in a supportive role mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, uh, looking at uh, children from a, a behavioral and a, a emotional and, and academic point of view uh, as to uh, how we could, could support some of the challenges that educators had in the classroom. So that kind of got me going in the direction of thinking about school psychology. And then when I got into my graduate program, I happened to work with an advisor who was doing research on uh, intervention and treatment for what we called at the time uh, ADD with hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that really you know, kind of set, set me uh, further in terms of looking at Yes, medication helps these students, but what can we do beyond medication to help them both uh, from an educational and psychological point of view? Okay, excellent. And I'm excellent. sure that's hard to balance too, uh, because I'm sure some people on one hand mm -hmm. uh, have a preference in comparison to the other. They, they support medication, others are saying, you yeah. know, and, and it's hard to, I'm sure, navigate. Yeah, and it's not an that. either or thing. Right. You know, I, it, you're right though, that people do take sides and, and that's unfortunate because um, that's not necessarily on the side of children to do that. Exactly. Uh, and that's the side we should be on. And yeah. so, uh, to me, I, I think that the data pr show pretty strongly that both intervention uh, modalities work for um, individuals with ADHD, there's just the question of which ones are going to work best for an individual. And you know, our our uh, bias is not bias. Our our um, uh, direction, and which is based on on research, is is to start first with behavioral and psychological support and educational support. And if if uh, there's still room for for growth, mm -hmm. uh, still room room to improve. That we then look at medication as a as a next line mm -hmm. of defense. And to me, that's that's the more important thing to think about sequencing, mm -hmm. and the to the degree to which you know uh, particular interventions are needed for an individual child. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I'm sure that's one of the challenges, but I'm wondering uh, what do you find to be maybe your greatest or top challenge um, in studying this population? Yeah, well, I think that um, the, the big challenge, you know, and I think this is true in intervention research in general, is the challenge of connecting research to practice. Mm. Uh, and and you know that's a, become almost a cliche, um, but but it's a true cliche right. <laughs> if, if if that's possible. Um, so we know we have the technology uh, available to support uh, individuals mm -hmm. with uh, ADHD or other emotion and behavior disorders, and for that matter, uh, those with learning disabilities as well. Uh, but um, oftentimes the research that's been done has been done under very ideal conditions and highly controlled conditions with paid research assistance and so forth. And uh, the transfer to the school, uh, real world school setting where uh, there's all kinds of variables to, uh, to consider and uh, individuals are extremely busy with the, the assignments they already have, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to uh, bring that research based um, intervention into, into that real world setting. And so I think that 
a lot of what we're trying to do now at Lehigh and, and elsewhere mm -hmm. is to design and evaluate interventions that are going to be feasible uh, for educators and other personnel in the schools to, to implement so that that gap between research to practice is closed or, or at least is not as wide. Hmm. And uh, along those same lines, um, what advice would you have for incoming new scholars who are also interested in sort of the same um, behavior interventions um, in those same kinds of settings? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd I would applaud anybody who's going into <laughs> this field and, and try to support them as best I could. I, I think that you have to have um, a lot of resilience and persistence and thick skin if you go into this direction of research because uh, intervention research in schools is extremely challenging uh, to do for a lot of reasons. And um, it's not pristine. It's not clean. It's not... Um, uh, highly controlled, and, and, and I actually think that's a good thing because that's reality, right. and um, you have to deal with failure uh, mm -hmm. perhaps more often than, than success, and mm -hmm. it's kind of like a baseball player where you, if you bat uh, 300, you know, 30% of the time you get a hit. That's, <laughs> that's uh, pretty successful in, yeah. in baseball. I, I think that in intervention research is a similar analogy yeah. that you know, if it, heck, if you're hitting 400 or 500 in intervention research, you're, you're doing a really good job. So it's it's about persistence, resilience, and, and, you know, knowing what you're getting into. I think people, when they're first starting out their career, you know, get really attracted to intervention research. Sounds very attractive for a lot of reasons, but it's uh, it's extremely uh, challenging and, and can be, um, you know, so I've seen early career scholars get, you know, discouraged mm -hmm. because things aren't as successful as they thought they would be initially, and, and it's right. just all about persistence at that point. Yeah, and I think that's a similarity for a lot of our fields, especially if you're talking about doing peer review, peer review research mm -hmm. and sort of going through that process. You got to get used to the <laughs> the rejections, the revisions, the resubmissions. Yep, it's it's just a, a part of uh, you know the career that 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 we've chosen right. at that particular point. And going after grants, same right. same thing. Right, you have to be. Uh, used to the fact that only about 10% of grant applications actually get funded, at least uh, initially. So, you know, it's, there's more failure than success, and you have to be persistent in that context. You mentioned baseball. You know, how, any support for your, your team? How's your, how's your team doing this, uh, this season? Uh, well, uh, for about a month <laughs> more, my team, the Boston Red Sox, will still be the defending champions, but uh, that's going to be short-lived. Uh, they are not making the playoffs this year, and... Uh, uh, but um, as long as the Yankees don't win, <laughs> I'll be okay. Uh, I, I apologize if either of you are Yankees fans, but um, yeah. We may have lost some of our viewers. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, don't, sorry. I don't watch sports or anything. Sorry, sorry about that. I try to support the Tigers each year, so, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah, well, talk about persistence, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, any professional team out of Michigan, it's just been, it's been tough. Anyway. <laughs> so how, how would you say or what advice would you give to these scholars that are going into this, realizing that there will be more failures than successes, but how do we cope or rationalize it in our day-to-day? -day? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, first of all, it's just, just knowing that, you know, that, that you don't measure success um, as being, a, you know, 100% hit rate on grants, on publications, on interventions being successful, that you measure success as, you know, kind of an incremental process where you're uh, building uh, data in a particular direction that's going to be helpful for students and that you're looking at, you know, you, you, you take a, a step back and look at all right, I've made some progress from where I was a year ago or two years ago where my program was then. Um, and so not to get hung up on individual challenges, but take a big picture look at it. The other thing I think that's really critical is none of us go at this alone. Uh, there aren't, we, we're not lone investigative um, teams. Uh, that, that's kind of an oxymoron, lone investigative team. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, we're part of teams that uh, within a university, across universities, and that support system is really critically uh, important, I think. So looking uh, back at your career so far, what has been the most rewarding? Yeah, um, well, I guess two things. One, one would be um, uh, the, the fact that I, I, I think that the work that I've done with my colleagues and students has had an impact on um, children's lives, that, that they're, um, you know, the, 
uh, it's a chronic uh, disorder, debilitating disorder, ADHD, and and um, and can be uh, really impact people in a in a very negative way. And and I'd like to think that to uh, at least uh, some extent, the research that we've done has made a difference, you know, in their lives in terms of particularly the school end of things. That some of the interventions that we've developed. Uh, to the extent that they are being used, um, has made an impact on on kids' academic and, and social and behavioral performance. Uh, so that by far is, and, and that's the reason we all get into this business, right? I mean, we're not, uh, we don't think about research in a, in a vacuum. Our research is, is meant to inform um, practice and policy so that people's lives are improved. Um, the other thing that I think has really been gratifying the 28 years now that I've been at Lehigh is, is um, is working with excellent students mm -hmm. uh, over the years, yeah. and and the energizing impact that has on mm -hmm. me, uh, and what I learn from them, and also just to see the growth of uh, students, you know, as they go in uh, go into their careers, and and to be able to look back and at our alums and and see all the wonderful things that they're doing to contribute uh, to education and to mental health um, research and practice, that that's extremely gratifying. Mm -hmm. Did you say 28 years? Yeah, this is my, <laughs> this is my 28th year. I started uh, when I was uh, uh, in, in kindergarten. Uh, I, I, I started my career here. Yeah, no, it's been 28 years, yeah. Wow. Wow. It doesn't, doesn't seem like it. I mean, time, time really flies. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it does. And the funny part is you, you never look older. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you you were you, you know, were, thanks for saying that, Floyd. But uh, <laughs> now, I don't know how you feel. Now yeah. you, you might feel different. Yeah, but. no, I feel different than I look. I, mean, I think I look pretty old. So you know, it's uh, it's a matter of perspective. Well, look, you, look. Well, remember, you were department you, you were department chair when I first came here. Yes, and. You, you know, it's like George always looks, you like look the same. Okay. <laughs> so whatever you're doing. All right. I appreciate you saying that. Now, now, Your uh, check's in the mail. <laughs> now, um, we spoke to one of the earlier misconceptions where you corrected the record, but maybe you could just speak to, um, are there some other misconceptions when it comes to understanding ADHD? Um, maybe could you uh, speak to the some of the facts versus some of the myths out there? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of myths that get spread about ADHD and autism and, right. and other disorders like that. Um, I think one of the myths that has been dispelled but still people uh, buy into for whatever reason is that uh, ADHD is just a childhood mm -hmm. disorder and that um, uh, people, uh, quote unquote, grow out of it, mm -hmm. which uh, is not true at all. Um, I mean, I, I think, thankfully, many individuals with ADHD learn to cope with their symptoms and, and can succeed in spite of their right. symptoms uh, or with treatment. But most individuals with ADHD continue to have those symptoms throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's important for us to have a life course perspective when we think about helping individuals with ADHD and not to sit back and say, well, uh, he's just a boy or, or he's just a, uh, you know, young kid and now he will, he or she will outgrow it. And I say he because uh, two thirds of uh, the population are, are male right. versus female. And maybe we can get into that later. But um, another um, uh, myth is that, um, uh, which we've already somewhat addressed, is that met, uh, on the opposite side of the equation from what we were talking about earlier with medication is that some people believe that um, well, if we medicate um, that we're done. Mm -hmm. You know, that if, if, if a child responds to medication, meaning that their problems with inattention, impulsivity, mm -hmm. and overactivity uh, diminish, that we don't need to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's unfortunate uh, people, that people buy into that. Because to me, the, val the real value of medication is that it puts the child in a position to learn. Mm -hmm. And now we need to take advantage of that uh, by bringing in uh, mental health and educational supports right. that the child can now focus on and, and improve with. So that's another myth that, um, that, that um, hopefully, you know, we're trying to dispel as, yeah. as much as possible. And maybe you could speak to is, um, wow, you had mentioned two thirds are male. Yeah. Wow, is there uh, somewhat higher even in, in clinical settings, it's even higher. It's like uh, three to one, so 75% <laughs> male. Is there, a, yeah, is there a ration sort of a reasoning behind well, I think there's a number number of things. Part of it may be a physiological uh, difference. I mean, males in general are at higher risk 
for um, what's called externalizing disturbance, meaning um, uh, brain functioning that may predispose an individual to being aggressive, active, impulsive, um, and, and that could be due to uh, genetic factors. Uh, there, there's a clear heritability uh, component to ADHD. In fact, there's some studies to show that it's as heritable as height, uh, which wow. is, you know, uh, obviously heritable. Uh, and the other is that the uh, males are more prone to uh, prenatal and perinatal uh, insults to brain uh, uh, de development. Mm. And, um, and so that could also impact. And then there, of course, are cultural factors. Mm. Uh, in, in terms of the way that we uh, acculturate mm -hmm. uh, boys versus girls and, mm -hmm. you know, what behaviors we expect and reinforce uh, in between the two uh, sexes. And uh, so I think that that's a piece of it as well. It, it, there's certainly clear research in recent years to indicate that there probably are more girls that have ADHD that are out there that are not mm -hmm. being diagnosed uh, mm -hmm. appropriately or not being identified. Uh, in part because uh, girls with ADHD tend not to be as aggressive or defiant or, uh, quite frankly, as obnoxious <laughs> as uh, boys with ADHD. And so, therefore, they're not, their teachers are not or, or right. their parents are not as likely to refer them for treatment as they are a boy who may be ADHD mm -hmm. and aggressive. So there's a, it's a fairly complex web, yep. but uh, it's kind of a combination of physiological, genetic, and cultural factors that I think um, account for those differences. Wow. Okay. So you just mentioned culture, and it just made me think of ADHD worldwide. What yeah. Does that, what does that look like? Are we as aware mm -hmm. in other parts of the world? Or Yeah, it's an excellent mm -hmm. question. Um, uh, it's been, this is a disorder that has been studied worldwide uh, in, in virtually every conf continent and, and country. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the worldwide prevalence appears to be around 5%, 5 to maybe 6%. So one out of every 20 children uh, wow. may have ADHD worldwide. But countries vary in the way they identify and follow up on mm -hmm. it. So we are a culture that uh, perhaps over-identifies mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, we have the latest figures are that approximately 11 percent of children and adolescents in the United States have been uh, diagnosed with ADHD at one point or another in their lives. Uh, whereas if you went to somewhere like the United Kingdom, the prevalence rate in terms of diagnosis is much lower. It's about mm. 2 percent. Mm. Um, now, part of that may be because we interpret children's behaviors in different ways. So here in the United States, we tend to look at things from a biological and physiological or medical point of view, whereas in the UK, they tend to look at uh, these kinds of uh, problems from more of a sociological mm -hmm. um, uh, standpoint. And um, so children that we might identify with ADHD here in the United States, in the UK, they may identify with conduct problems. So they still identify them with problems, but they're not labeling it. Mm -hmm. The same, so the, differently. yeah, so they're categorizing it differently, and they're less likely to medicate in the UK, uh, whereas we're more likely to medicate. So, where the culture piece comes in is kind of the interpretation and labeling process, and ultimately the treatment process. Uh, but when we look at things from a controlled epidemiological, uh, which is the kind of research we do to look at prevalence, uh, these are kids that exist uh, everywhere. Wow. You made me think of this. Um, in terms of the identification process, um, whereas we know that some of the research is a lot more clinical, how far along are we towards um, better ways to clinically identify? Because I, I still would assume that the identification process still would come from um, a psychologist, right? Not necessarily. There's no medical test, right? Right. Uh, there are no medical tests. Right. Absolutely not. Uh, now, we could get there at some point right. uh, with some of the brain uh, imaging technologies that we have, um, you know, to the extent that those evolve to a point where they're safe and, and uh, less expensive, mm -hmm. and to the extent that we're able to identify uh, markers uh, that are reliable and valid mm -hmm. indicators of ADHD. So that's a long way off, mm -hmm. I think. Um, 
the um, but to to your point, the, the one of the challenges in terms of diagnosis is that the diagnosis is being made by a variety of health professionals. The the yep. number one professional group that identifies or diagnosis a, diagnoses ADHD are pediatricians, because mm -hmm. that's typically where parents go with these concerns, and uh, pediatricians don't. Uh, get a lot of training mm -hmm. in diagnosis of ADHD. Um, and so the, there, there's varied methods that they would use in terms of reliability and validity. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, so, there, so that, that enters into the equation in right. terms of diagnostic rate. Um, right now, the best way that we have to go about diagnosing ADHD is through getting structured uh, reports and observations from parents and right. teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, through uh, behavior rating scales, through diagnostic interviews. Um, as school psychologists, uh, we, we, we would go into the classroom and observe children's behavior in different conditions and look at their behavior relative to their classmates. Um, we may also um, look at uh, certainly the, the degree to which their symptoms impair in, uh, their, their uh, functioning, uh, because to have ADHD, you have to not only have the symptoms, but you also have to be impaired. Uh, meaning that you're struggling academically or you're struggling socially. Uh, and so we look at data in, in regards to that impairment and, and then piece all of that together into a, a comprehensive evaluation. And most pediatricians are not equipped or trained to do that kind of thing. And uh, so um, it ends up, you know, in a, in a, good kind, a good diagnostic context that would end up being uh, funneled to a psychologist mm -hmm. or psychiatrist or another mental health professional who is able to carry through a comprehensive evaluation. Yeah. But could a pediatrician, could a pediatrician make the diagnosis? Oh, yeah. Uh, they do all the time. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I'm not to say, you know, some of my best friends are right. pediatricians. <laughs> I want to make that clear. I have a high, high degree of respect for pediatricians and what they do. Um, but, you know, think about it uh, in terms of, you know, your typical um, pediatric visit um, is pretty brief. Yeah. You know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, anything beyond 15 minutes is really uh, challenging for pediatricians. And uh, you can't do a comprehensive evaluation of ADHD in 15 minutes. It's just not possible. And uh, so the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has very... Um, um, good guidelines in terms of diagnosis of ADHD. Uh, unfortunately, many pediatricians are not able to follow through on those guidelines. Uh, it's kind of that connection between research and practice we were talking about earlier, yep. is it doesn't fit into a busy practice mm -hmm. where um, the physicians need to be thinking about billable hours and all of that kind of thing. Right, wow. Okay. Now, so what are some of the ways that schools can foster a more inclusive environment for students with behavioral disorder uh, and the like? Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good question that, that would take a lot to answer. Uh, we need that's, another I think, session. Yeah, I think that people's <laughs> careers are centered around that, so it's, it's, it's hard to answer in, a, in a, you know, a really concise way, although I'll try to. Um, I think that, that what is the... Um, is, is kind of the optimal way that that can happen is through uh, a structured system of positive behavior supports mm -hmm. uh, or uh, PBIS, positive behavior intervention support, uh, which by the way are um, affiliated school, Centennial mm -hmm. School uh, that's affiliated with the College of Education is an excellent example of implementation of positive behavior support uh, where um, you have kind of a, a, a first level of um, expectations around behavior and uh, reinforcement of that behavior on the part of teachers and, and uh, administrators. And then you, um, to the extent that students are um, not successful with those universal supports, mm. they may require uh, additional, uh, more intensive support around positive reinforcement in particular. And then uh, for some individuals, they may require um, uh, additional supports that could include medication or other uh, types of, of, right. uh, of entities. And uh, so that's kind of the, the, the uh, holy grail, uh, if you will, of um, uh, promoting the inclusion of uh, children with emotion behavior disorders in general education classrooms is to have a school-wide system of positive behavior support 
where all kids are being uh, held to uh, specific standards and are being positively reinforced on a regular basis for their adherence to those. Yep. Uh, there's more to it than that, but you know that's kind of the short answer at this point. We'll have a part two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, this goes now. This next question kind of goes to the theory of theory to practice. Um, how do we make the academic language that we utilize? Because mm. in in the academy, we have to write, speak, you know, communicate in certain ways to the academic community. Uh, but how do we make academic language more accessible uh, for for groups like parents or families? so they can better understand some of these cutting edge studies? Yeah, that's a real good question as well. <laughs> um, and uh, one that, you know, I think that, that uh, I've tried throughout my career to try to, to adhere to, uh, but you fall into traps of, of jargon that you don't even realize it is jargon. Like right. we use the term in my field a lot about appropriate behavior, mm. that we're trying to encourage appropriate behavior on the part of students. And I've had uh, instances where I've used that term with parents or, or other folks, and they're like, what do you mean by appropriate? What does that even mean, appropriate behavior? Um, and, you know, how do you define that and mm -hmm. all that? So um, trying to reduce jargon is something that I always try to check myself on to varying degrees of success. <laughs> uh, and also try to encourage my students to, you know, from the beginnings of their career to, um, to be able to think along those lines and to, and to communicate along those lines. But it's a struggle. I, I think that that's one of the, the reasons why we have had some challenges in translating research to practice is because we're speaking different languages and we're coming from different cultures, if you right. will. And, and so there's a cultural difference and there's a language difference and we're trying to negotiate that. I, I think that one way that we as researchers could um, try to address that gap is by recruiting people from the community who uh, we've been able to build relationships with who can give us honest feedback and honest advice, um, you know, hey, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, uh, sending this article to a parent magazine and, and uh, what do you what do you think? Is this is this understandable? Is it uh, at the right level? Uh, does it make sense from your point of view? And so checking ourselves versus, uh, if you will, experts in the other culture. Um, so parents or teachers or other folks that we have relationships with. Uh, who can give us some guidance, I think that that would be an important way to go because we could, the three of us could sit here and decide, oh yeah, this <laughs> should make sense to parents and uh, that that may not be the case because we're operating within our academic culture and, and the yeah. language that's endemic to this culture. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things we talk about in, in some of our courses is, is this idea of how to, how to be a cultural translator in mm -hmm. many cases. So That's it's, a great term. It's learning how to speak the academic language in one setting, but if you're going to go into another setting mm -hmm. where you're speaking to the community or families, or, um, and then we say it's incumbent upon you because you're the person who has the probably the broadest view of knowledge, right? So, it's, so how do you translate what you know to the particular audience mm -hmm. right. that's in front of you at that particular time? Yep. And take the time to get to know the audiences right. that you will encounter. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, building relationships. Right. Yeah, with our stakeholders, with the groups that we ultimately want to impact with our research, yep. critically important. Yep. And I think this is our last, uh, it might be our last question here. It is. All right. So uh, we're going to go to your, your new role now yes. as the uh, Associate Dean for Research. So what is your primary goal this year for the College of Education as the Associate Dean for Research? Wow. One goal, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try to narrow it down. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me mention two. <laughs> okay. So one we've uh, kind of alluded to, so I can go quickly, <laughs> and that is the helping uh, our colleagues to uh, translate their research into policy. Mm -hmm. I think that we have you know, some degree of familiarity with trying to translate research to practice. But we're trying to, to work um, with uh, legislative staffs at the federal and state mm -hmm. level to advocate for educational research and support of educational research. And um, I th what we're finding is that, that it's going to be really helpful in that enterprise to be able to say, mm -hmm. okay, Floyd, you've done these studies. How does this, how do your findings then translate to policy that should be considered at the federal or state level or even local mm -hmm. level. Right. And so that's one of my goals. The, the other is, um, and Tashin is well aware of this, is mm -hmm. to try to come up with ways to uh, build collaboration 
uh, across our programs. We have a, a relatively small college, uh, both in terms of faculty and student size. Small but mighty. Small but mighty, <laughs> yes, exactly. But we, but we tend to be in our silos, Very right? True. So educational leadership yep. folks hang with educational mm -hmm. leadership folks. School psychology folks hang with school right. psychology folks. And, uh, you know, we have common interests and, and, and common directions that we want to take. And so trying to, uh, to come up with ways to build more interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, um, because I think we can leverage our mightiness, mm -hmm. you know, that way uh, in, 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 in a more collaborative way. So, um, so Tashin is part of, uh, of uh, um, an advisory group of, of uh, college uh, students in our college who are uh, helping me to, to figure out ways to uh, support graduate student research mm -hmm. uh, and including the, the fostering of collaboration. And we had an excellent event uh, earlier this <laughs> week uh, where um, we had, I think, 24, 25 students mm -hmm. from across the programs just share their research interests and ideas and, and have already built, I think, some connections that weren't there Across uh, before departments that day. and even within departments. Yes. So students that were working together, taking classes for the same amount of time, they learn new things about each other. So Fabulous. that was really wonderful. And we'd like to see that happen at the faculty mm -hmm. uh, end of things as well. I mean, it already does happen to some degree, but I think there are ways that we could be fostering more collaboration across disciplines. Yep. George, maybe you could speak to, um, you, you had mentioned research to policy, yep. and I thought about the, do you remember a few years back when we got some policy guidance from, um, I don't know if it came from the Department of Education, but it really curtailed the language that we could use mm. um, for, some, for some federal grants. And some of that language even questioned, it questioned equity, data. They were saying, I'm trying to think back to exactly when that was. I don't remember that. The general question, though, is um, different administrations change yeah. at the federal <laughs> level, which yes, then do. impact, uh, just like I said, grant accessibility, mm -hmm. you know, what we study, how we can study it. Um, how do you see your role in especially interacting with federal entities in mm -hmm. dealing with sort of the changing, like I say, grander more grand political structure? Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a big way of saying, you know, I think you know where I'm headed with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Things change. Sure. How do we maintain, you know? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, um, and it's a good coincidence here. I, I just came from um, Washington. I was mm -hmm. in Washington the last two days with our dean, with Bill Gaudelli, mm -hmm. and, and our, um, we have a legislative um, liaison, uh, Chris Carter, who, who is based in Washington, who, mm -hmm. who advocates for Lehigh uh, at, the, at the federal level. And um, we are part of, our College of Education is part of something called the LEARN Coalition, which I don't know what LEARN stands for, <laughs> uh, other than that it's, a, it's, a, it's advocacy for educational research funding. Mm -hmm. And so they meet twice a year in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, and the meeting was yesterday uh, for the fall. And um, it, it involves us meeting with, we met yesterday with uh, legislative staffs with, for four uh, con mm -hmm. Congress people, including our local congresswoman. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really comes back to what we were talking about earlier, building relationships. And, and so we uh, go in to meet with these folks on a regular basis, uh, at least once a semester, and they learn more about what we're up to mm -hmm. and the value of the research that we do based mm -hmm. on the grants that we receive and the value to our communities, local, regional, national communities mm -hmm. of these research uh, endeavors. And um, yes, those staff members may change over time. Those Congress people may change over time. But if we have a continued presence there, um, people learn to trust us. Uh, people learn to, uh, to look to us when certain questions come up regarding policy. And, and so it's a long-term process, but I think um, that we, you know, we have some good, um, um, good directions that we're taking along those lines. And it's good to know we have uh, that kind of representation at the at the, at the federal level in Washington D.C. That's uh, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, and I think they're paying more attention to the education piece of it. Mm -hmm. it's um, about time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, just one quick fact that's kind of sobering about educational research funding in this mm -hmm. country: mm -hmm. um, we spend, as a country, one half of one percent of our research and development dollars on education research. So 0.5% of our federal research dollars 
is spent on educational research. Wow. So, you know, to me, it's pretty remarkable that in that context, we get to, we do what we do. Exactly. And that we can make an impact with what we do. Um, so part of what we're, uh, we're trying to do, uh, Lehigh, as part of this Learn Coalition, is to build up that one, and, uh, you know, that half yeah. of one percent to, uh, heck, we'll take one percent, <laughs> right? Please. You could double it, and we'd only be at one percent, and we'd be thrilled. Well, George, do you have uh, anything else you may want to share with our, our audience and any of the things we covered? Or well, these have been excellent questions. I really appreciated the opportunity mm -hmm. to talk to, to both of you, and I applaud you uh, doing these po uh, podcasts, and, and I hope that the millions of viewers <laughs> out there are uh, appreciative of the work that you both are doing. Well, thank you very much. So we certainly want to thank uh, Dr. George DePaul for uh, joining us for this particular episode. Dashina, as always, I want to thank you for all the hard work uh, that you do. Thank you for making this happen, Dr. Beecham. No problem, no problem. And thank you in our audience, wherever you might be. Join us next time when our topic, well, I'm not going to tell you the topic right now. You have to <laughs> tune in, of course. <laughs> but again, thank you for your time and your efforts and anything and everything that you do for education for the 21st century. We'll see you next time.